Good morning. Welcome to Westover Baptist Church online worship service. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together. Know that while we may not be worshiping in the same space, God has his richest blessings for you as you view this service. We invite you to download the worship service bulletin on our homepage. Wherever you find yourself in life, we want this to be a worship experience you can depend on for receiving inspiration, encouragement, and support. Now, wherever you are, whether it's at the kitchen table or on the couch, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Our first hymn is number 147, And Can It Be? The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed each of our lives, and one of the ways it has made a significant change all around the world 
and here in the Arlington community is increasing the need for food assistance. We have partnered for a number of years with the Arlington Food Assistance Center, and typically we have food drives at least two times per year. The need is greater, so we ask that you join us in supporting our neighbors in need and drop off canned goods and non-perishable foods that will be donated to the Arlington Food Assistance Center. The drop-off location is at the church, and the donation box is inside of Door 2 on the Patrick Henry Drive side of the building. We thank you for your support. Although we're not able to be on campus for worship service and for our other ministry activities, we do have ongoing expenses to maintain the building, support staff, and provide community support. We are grateful to those who have been able to continue to give during this time. It has been very helpful to us. We are providing several ways that you can give. You can give online or through our church website. If you go to our website, there is a button that is marked Give on the right-hand side of the home page. You can click that button and you are asked for particular information about your gift. You can set up your gift as a one-time gift or a recurring gift and then provide your banking information. Using your mobile phone, you can give by texting. Send a text to the number 73256 and then in the body of the text message, you would type in capital W, capital C, capital A, lowercase r, lowercase l, and the amount of your gift and hit enter. Then a screen will come up and ask you for your banking or credit card information. You may also continue to mail your gift to the church. The mail is monitored daily. Or you may drop your gift off to the church and put it in the church office mail slot, which is the door between the flagpoles facing Patrick Henry Drive. Some of you may take advantage of online banking through your own bank and have the bank send a check through the mail. You may use any of these methods to provide your gift, and we sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, so many of us have been doing church, well, differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual, Living rooms and coffee shops have become sanctuaries. And fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy. Yet, here we are. Gathering, worshiping, learning, being the church. Now more than ever, we're reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. Our scripture reading is titled, Salvation is God's Gift. It is taken from the New Testament book of Ephesians, the second chapter, the seventh through the tenth verse of the New Living Translation. Salvation is God's gift. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. We have salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. Join together for our next hymn, number 330, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Hello, I'm Rev. Michael Youngblood, Senior Pastor of Westover Baptist Church. I'm really glad that you're here with us today, that you can worship with us. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you haven't, would you sign our guest book? We would love to have a record that you are with us today. If you're part of our family, you're with us every Sunday. We would like to have a record to know that you're still here with us. And if this is your first time, that's also important. We would like to share our next newsletter with you. So if you would leave your contact information, we'll be sure to share that with you. And just a note to say thank you for joining us. We are very happy that you're with us. We do have some things coming up on the calendar that I'd like to share with you. January has a fifth Sunday. Typically on the fifth Sunday, we have our Family and Friends Day. That's a time where we roll out the red carpet to invite those who don't normally worship with us, whether it be a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker, whoever. So in this season of COVID, we're doing it a little bit different. We will be meeting by, by Zoom. You'll find on our website, starting at 1215, on the fifth Sunday, the last Sunday of this month, we'll come together for a fellowship. We'll have a game, if you will, share with one another, catch up on the latest things that are going, see how the children are growing, and just come together. The Bible encourages us to always come together as Christians to, to, to celebrate what God has done for us and to encourage one another. So I hope that you will join us. Going forward, we hope to have this fellowship on the fourth Sunday, or the last Sunday, I should say, of every month. But more information will be coming on that. Also, I'd like to share with you that we're going to begin having a parking lot service on the first Sunday of the month. We'll start this on the 7th of February, which will be the first Sunday of February. We had a tremendous success with our candlelight Christmas Eve service that we conducted in a parking lot where individuals were able to stay in their vehicles, but yet we were able to come together and worship. I'm inviting you, you'll be able to stay in your car. We have, will have the equipment set up so that all you'll have to do is turn to a 
Pacific FM station and you'll be able to hear the audio. I'll, of course, bring the message uh, probably again from the back of my truck. But if we can come together where there is a will, there is a way. And I'm tremendously excited about this opportunity. So I hope you'll join us on the first Sunday of February is when we will start the 7th of February at 11 a.m in our upper parking lot, which is at the corner of Patrick Henry and 11th Street. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you to each and every person who provided financial support to our ministry last year. Know that you made a difference. You enabled us to meet our budget. We'll be able to meet our financial obligations, be able to maintain our building, be able to add on more equipment so that we can communicate to you in this electronic age. But thank you. You made a difference. And I pray that our ministry continues to support you, to provide to you a message of God, his hope, his love, and his care for us. And by your support, you enable us to keep reaching out to you, to share with you, and to be here with you. Thank you. How can a Christian survive without prayer? I think it's impossible. Jesus gave us numerous examples that we can find in the Bible where he prayed constantly and regularly to God. Shouldn't we do likewise? God has given us this medium, this ability to talk to him and to share with him because he cares. It's not just an empty message box that we're leaving something at. It's not just a, a voicemail that we don't know that someone will respond to. But God wants to meet us in prayer. For us to share with him, to tell him our concerns, our thanks, our gratitude. That's the type of love he has for us. Prayer is a vital part of our worship experience each time we meet. So won't you join me in prayer now as we come together for our corporate prayer. If you have a prayer request, I encourage you. We have a place on our website that you can leave that prayer request. We will gladly join you in prayer that God will honor your request and that you will feel strength and security from knowing that he cares for you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give reverence and honor to you. Our Father in heaven, we give reverence, honor, and glory to your holy name. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for each of your blessings to each individual, to our nation, and all of the world. We would be unwise to suppose that we are solely responsible for providing our needs. You have been faithful to your word to provide for all of our needs. It is often said, God bless America. Truly, Lord, we do need your blessings. Only you can cause each individual to see your requirements to love you and to also love one another. May we realize that if we would humble ourselves, forsake our disobedience to you, you promised that you would heal our land. From the Keys of Florida to Neal Bay, Washington, from San Cecilio, California, the Metawaska, Maine, I pray that every man, woman, boy and girl would know you as their Lord and Savior. Let there be truth and peace in our nation. May our leaders seek your wisdom and act honorably to you and to your, the people they serve. Give healing to the sick and comfort to those who are mourning. Give courage to the faint and strength to the weak. We ask these blessings 
In Jesus' name, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Today, God has blessed us. To be able to receive a word from one of his messengers, Minister Earl Moore. God has blessed him with a message titled, A Godly Prescription Lens. Hear now the word of the Lord as Minister Moore comes to us as God has given him blessing and utterance. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. For this is another day and another year that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and happy new year to Pastor Youngblood, First Lady Jacqueline Youngblood, and the entire Westover Baptist Church congregation. I bring you greetings from Alpha Tree Baptist Church in Old Town, Alexandria, under the leadership of my pastor, Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. When I was given this assignment in December, the Holy Spirit led me to 2 Corinthians. And many of you are aware that the Apostle Paul wrote Romans and 2 Corinthians. During Pastor Youngblood's first sermon of the new year, I learned what Westover's theme was for 2021, and it was in the form of a question. What does it mean to be a Christian? I would suggest that this sermon provides one answer to that question. Let us pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, I do pray. Amen. The sermon this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 18. And it is entitled, God's Prescription Lens. I would suggest that we see through God's lens to be a Christian. The scripture reading is as follows. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, do not lose heart Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. As you can see, I wear glasses. 
These are prescription lenses. There were a series of situations that culminated, which led me to believe I may have a vision problem. One such situation was as a teenager. We moved to Florida from Detroit, Michigan, and we drove. While in the van with my mother, stepfather, and younger brother, my task was to help read the map and let them know what exit was approaching. This was during the time that GPS did not exist. There was no Google Maps, MapQuest, or Waze. We had what they called a trip tick from AAA. You could plan out your trip and there would be a yellow highlight of the route along the highway from the beginning to the end. There would be multiple numbered maps. Well, my mother became frustrated when we would continuously miss an exit because by the time I read it, we were so close that we passed the exit. Eventually she started to say, boy, I'm gonna get your eyes checked. Some of you may have discovered your vision problems while in the classroom, while attempting to take notes from the chalkboard. Maybe it was during the time that ear and eye exams became routine checkups during the school year. Whatever the situation, something caused you to realize that your vision was distorted. I'm sure that those who eventually got a prescription like me have said, I didn't realize how much I was missing out on. I discovered that I was nearsighted, which meant I could not see things far away. Some people are farsighted and cannot see things close. Some only need reading glasses. Now there are lenses for computer screens, sun glare, and on and on. The reality is that we need a certain type of doctor to diagnose our vision problems. I learned that there are three types of eye doctors, ophthalmologists, optometrist, and optician. The level of training, experience, and expertise is different for each type of provider. The ophthalmologist is a medical doctor who has a four-year degree and then a minimum of eight plus years of medical training. The optometrist has a three or four-year degree and four years of optometry school. The optician is trained to design and fit eyeglasses, frames, and contact lenses. If you're going to the eye doctor for the first time, or have a history of eye problems, many would recommend that you go to an ophthalmologist. This doctor can assess the signs or risk for eye disease. Some of those risk factors are bulging of one or both eyes, decreased vision, even if temporary, diabetes, distorted vision, double vision. If you have a family history of eye disease, high blood pressure. Now you will be introduced or reintroduced to the Apostle Paul, the writer of this passage who I would argue is acting as God's ophthalmologist. The Apostle Paul will address some of the risk factors of eye disease for the Corinthians and their need for God's prescription lens. Let me teach it while I preach it because I know Deacon Frank Jackson here at Westover is an advocate of teaching. Some of you know that there are 66 books or writings in what we call the Bible, which consists of the New Testament and the Old Testament. There are 29 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. At least one third of the New Testament writings are attributed to the Apostle Paul. Some familiar ones are Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philemon, 1st Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and others. Some of you may recall that the Apostle Paul, formerly named Saul, was a persecutor of Christians. However, Paul had an encounter which led him to Jesus. Paul became a missionary and he established churches on his missionary journeys. Now, Paul was at Corinth for 18 months. And I remember this past Sunday, 
we had a discussion in Sunday school about evangelizing. Essentially, if you wanted to evangelize to someone the truth, how would you approach it? We threw out many things from about being humble, uh, about not trying to pressure people. But one of the things that came to me after that Sunday school lesson was relationship. We see the apostle Paul had an 18 month relationship with the church at Corinth. And you cannot evangelize to someone if you don't have a relationship with them. Paul developed relationships. When Paul left or moved on, he would write letters to the churches that he established. These were called occasional letters. Let the church say occasional letters. When there were issues in the church, Paul would write a letter to the church to address the issue. So let me help someone at Westover. Suppose that Pastor Youngblood is a church planter and he planted Westover Baptist Church here in Arlington, Virginia. He also planted churches in California, Pennsylvania, DC, and other states. While away, Pastor Youngblood heard about some situations at Westover that he thought needed to be addressed while he was away. So he writes a letter to the congregation. Therefore, it is called an occasional letter. The reality of these letters is that sometimes it may seem like a one-way conversation. We don't always know exactly what issues the community was dealing with, and it is deduced from how the Apostle Paul is responding or writing the letter. Let me break it down further. Remember as a child, when you listened, listened in on your mother's conversation. Now, I know some of you were saved from the womb, but for those who were not, we heard mama respond, but you did not hear what the person said on the other end. The New Testament has first and second Corinthians. However, it is believed that there were one or two other lost letters, but we can leave that to Pastor Youngblood's Bible study. Paul established the church at Corinth. Corinth was like this DMV area. And for those who are new to the area, DMV means DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Corinth was one of the richest cities and greatest trading centers in the ancient world. It was a cosmopolitan port city of Greeks, Jews, and other peoples. Corinth was known for its wealth, luxury, and immorality. Paul preached Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. But while Paul was away, some others came through Corinth who were teaching something different. There were Judaizers. Let the church say Judaizers. These were Christians who taught it was necessary to adopt Jewish customs and practices. There was even the debate whether Christians needed to be circumcised. Paul was a Jew and so was Jesus. But Paul taught that nothing else was necessary except belief in Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Now, there were those who challenged Paul's apostolic authority based upon Paul's resume. If you know Paul's resume, although he wrote powerful letters, his speech was not very impressive in person. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 16, reads, Paul states that I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have constantly been on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false 
believers. You get the picture, Westover. Paul has been through some things. However, those who came through Corinth, what we call the super apostles, they were pitching a form of prosperity gospel that your life should be all good if you are truly a follower of Jesus. This gospel sounds like something mighty good to this Corinthian church in a city that's known for its wealth, luxury, and immorality. If you look at verse seven, it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. Typically when something is valuable, we package it in such a way to indicate its value. When I proposed to my wife, the jewelry box that the jewelry store put the diamond ring in was beautiful. My wife would have been upset if I presented the ring in a cracker, bat, cracker Jack box. Now, some of you may be too young to understand about the Cracker Jack box, but back in the day, each of those boxes had a little toy inside. And that toy was flimsy and cheap, but yet we were excited to get to that toy. You might also remember even in the cereal box, there were toys in the boxes, but those toys were flimsy and cheap. My wife really would have been upset. This also got me thinking because one of my son's Christmas gifts this year, the present was a necklace from the Shaquille O'Neal collection. And I knew that the jewelry box would indicate to him that the gift had value. The truth of the matter is that even when things don't have value, we try to package it in such a way to give the impression of value. As a society, we value the way people are dressed. We value the titles and the degrees on the wall. But Paul tells the Corinthian church that we are jars of clay. We are dirt. We are weak. We are fragile. If you drop us, we may crack. God put the treasure of the ministry of Jesus in us so that there is no distraction, so that there is no mistake that the power within us comes from God. I know there may be two or three here at Westover who have experienced sickness and death and faced the reality that they are jars of clay. We heard of families who have lost several loved ones to COVID-19 and they faced the reality that they are a jar of clay. There are those in ministry who are exhausted and continuously quote the scripture not to grow weary in well-doing. Paul is suggesting to the church at Corinth that we live in a world where it will rain on the just and the unjust. Let us tell the truth that you may have encountered a family member or a friend who has problem after problem. And you may have said to him or her, they must be doing something wrong. I do not know what God he is serving. You know, uh, a few months ago, my wife and I had a referral of a handyman to do some work in the house. And the first time I called him, he was not available. The second time I called him, he was scheduled to come by and he indicated that his car had a flat tire and he could not come. The second time I scheduled him to come, it was raining outside and he never showed up and he never called. The third time or fourth time I called him, he indicated that he had two or three deaths in his family. And just to be a little transparent, I did tell my wife, although I prayed for him, I said, I don't know if I want someone to come work on the house if that person has so much problems. I felt bad for him, but at the same time, I said, he just has too many problems. Well, Paul's opponents were making these same arguments about him to the Corinthian church while Paul was away. In their view, Paul did not fit the description 
of an apostle with authority. Paul argues that our vision is distorted if we believe that life will always be full of sunshine. If we read verse eight through 10, it reads, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Corinth was the center of what they call the Isthmian Games, which was second only to the Olympic Games. There were athletes engaging in gladiator battles, wrestling matches, and other events to showcase their power. Now, Paul uses this familiar language to the Corinthians because he knew they could relate. If you remember Paul's language in Corinthians, you also will remember his language in Ephesians, where he uses language of putting on the full armor of God. Paul talks about the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. These are elements of the Roman soldier's battle gear, which Paul became familiar with because he was a prisoner. If you look back at Greek art, you will see carved scenes from battles of the games. Paul is painting a picture of what it means to be a Christian. No, it is not all fun and games. Sometimes the problems and issues of life are pressing us on every side, but God keeps us from being crushed. Sometimes we don't know which way to turn or what decision to make, but God keeps us from giving up. We face trials and persecution, but we know God will journey with us and not abandon us. Paul is suggesting that some of the things Jesus experienced in his crucifixion that we will experience also. However, we know the end of the story. It said Jesus rose with all power in his hand. Paul would argue that a Christian realizes that suffering like Jesus suffered is a part of the journey. But Jesus declares, my grace is sufficient. What does grace mean? Grace means getting something from God that we did not deserve. In verse 16 through 17, the scripture reads, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know, it has been said that we are born with an expiration date. Some have even used the trite phrase that two things that are certain, death and taxes. I think of the process of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's not an exact comparison, but the caterpillar sheds its shell. It's then enclosed in a protective casing during which time it is radically transforming its body. And then it emerges as a beautiful butterfly. Our bodies, which is a jar of clay, is not made to last for eternity. Our light and momentary troubles, Paul is imagining a scale. On one end is our troubles, and on the other end is eternal glory. The eternal glory outweighs the troubles of this world. This became real to me when I ministered to those in prison or those with a terminal illness. What do you tell the Christian who may have a lifetime sentence in jail? Now we know that not everyone gets a pardon or a commuted sentence. What hope does that person have? What about the person who is ill 
but suffering in pain every day and wanting to die. There may be someone here today who is ready to give up. Someone who is ready to give up on God because of the suffering you are experiencing right now. Paul is suggesting that we see our suffering through the lens of eternity. Revelations 21.4 says that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things will be passed away. And finally, verse 18 reads, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, this is essentially a remake of the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Now, I used the Message Bible translation, which reads as follows. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle on what we cannot see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. The apostle Paul was reminding the Corinthians and he's reminding us today of what it means to be a Christian. We must see through God's prescription lens. God's prescription lens is able to correct our vision so that we journey through 2021. We do not lose heart. May God continue to bless your ministry and your witness in the Arlington, Virginia community and beyond. Bless you, Westover Baptist Church. In speaking of the kingdom of God, Jesus often gave examples of, he who has an ear, let him hear. For those who don't see, who don't have the insight, he prayed that God would allow them to see that there is a kingdom of God and our requirements. If you have not asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, this is an opportunity to open up your heart and your life to Him. It's a great honor and privilege to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Matter of fact, I would say it's even a matter of life and death. Jesus wants to be with you in this life and the life to come. He wants to be your companion and your friend and your guide. And he wants to provide for you the gift of God, the forgiveness of your sins. And if we have faith in him, if we repent of our sins, he said that he would give us salvation and a deposit of the Holy Spirit in our life. If you have not accepted Jesus, won't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord, I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus is your son, Lord. That he died on Calvary's cross. Not for his wrong, but for the sins of all humanity. I believe and know in my heart that because Jesus rose from the dead, by my faith in him, I also will live an eternal life beyond the strength of this physical body. Come into my life, dear Lord. I make you my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pray that the songs, I pray that the message, I pray that something we have said or done today 
will be a blessing to you and an encouragement. Know that God loves you and that he cares for you. You are the crown of his creation. You're one of a kind. And he loves you with all of his heart. John said it this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Until we meet again, I pray that God accompanies you on every step of your path, and that you will put your faith and your trust in him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we leave this gathering, this assembly, hear our prayer, hear our cry. I pray for each and every one under the sound of my voice. I pray for each and every individual, Lord, that seeks you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great day.